I just think that you know, veterans are a great source for the agricultural world. I um, and mm-hmm. I believe that veteran farmers, you know, not not the pure future of agriculture, but I think by adding us in and, you know, and bringing us into agricultural world with our purpose, motivation and direction and our, you know, desire to be successful, no matter mm-hmm. what the circumstances are in front of us, uh, I think is a great addition to the whole agricultural operations. In this episode of Voices from the Field, Margot Hale, NCAT's Southeast Regional Director and Director of NCAT's Arm to Farm Program, visits with Charlie Jordan, a flower farmer in Tennessee. Charlie is a military veteran and talks with Margot about his journey to farming. Charlie discusses his farm operation and the enterprises he has pursued, including how his military service and farming experiences led him to horticulture therapy. Charlie shares his passion for horticulture therapy and for using agriculture to help others heal. Charlie also discusses USDA programs and other resources he has used to help his farm. Let's listen. Hi, this is Margot Hale with NCAT Southeast Regional Office. And today on our ATRA Voices from the Field podcast, I am joined by Charlie Jordan. And Charlie is a farmer veteran in Tennessee. And I am just so thrilled to get to have a conversation with you today, Charlie. Awesome. I am, I am too. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'll let I'll let you give your introduction and kind of tell tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into farming and and we'll get into your farming journey here in a little bit but just give us a, a brief overview of kind of who you are and and what you're doing well awesome well i want to say thank you for uh including me on this uh this this podcast i i, I watch them all the time uh so i'm really cool uh, i was really excited when you invited me to come on here so i appreciate it uh so f- uh for me my name is charlie jordan uh i'm 52 years young and i'm am a very able disabled veteran I served uh, 28 and a half years in the uh, United States Army. Most of my career upwards of uh, over 20 years of it was actually here in the Fort Campbell, Kentucky area in Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, I was with a uh, fantastic organization called the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment. Uh, got to be with them for an awful long time, and it was fantastic. And uh, my farming journey actually started many, many, many years ago by accident. Um, it was, I was... Uh, Always uh, in a military uh, family, I've grown up with a uh, green ID card. I've never known anything different. So my family uh, at the time was my grandma and grandpa in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And uh, he got um, stationed up in South Dakota. And we were living in uh, Florida at the time. Uh, I was a little blonde haired, blue eyed kid. Uh, running on the beach, and uh, we decided to move to Sioux Falls, South Dakota for a couple of years, and that was part of his uh, um, uh, his, his army part or whatever, his uh, PCS, so we were there, and I just, something grabbed me, I don't know what it was, I just uh, had great friends, had a lot of friends who were uh, Sioux Indian, uh, I had a lot of friends who were farmers, and I would go on the weekends to their farms, and I just fell in love with it, and granted, I was 10 or 11 years old at the time, but I absolutely fell in love with it, you know, playing with the cows and all the, you know, pigs and all this and the big row crops um, there in South Dakota, huge operations. And and it just blew me away. Uh Uh, And then we moved back to uh, Florida uh, about 1982 or so. And, uh, and then my grandmother always had a wonderful garden, uh, and she uh, she was a survivor of the uh, work camps, uh, concentration camps of World War II in Poland. Uh, she was uh, full Polish, and uh, she'd tell you that uh, right away as you met her. Uh, and she always had beautiful gardens, and uh, and I was always just out in the gardens playing and uh, stealing the vegetables and fruits that she was growing, and uh, and it just kind of stuck with me. Henceforward, you know, I, I basically joined the army in 1989 and uh, that was it. I, I went on and 20 years later, 2001, I was like, I think I have an opportunity to get me a, a farm finally. Uh, uh-huh. And I did. And I bought the farm that I'm on now and uh, the rest is uh, history. The rest is history. <laughs> so, yep. Mm-hmm. I love that it's those those childhood connections that um, mm-hmm. brought you brought you back or brought you to the farm, and that's that's great. So, 
why? So you had those, those childhood connections, but was there something at that point when you bought the farm that was like, okay, now I'm going to be a farmer or that was just something you had always been thinking about and wanted to do. And you finally had the opportunity to do it. Uh, pretty much that's, that's how it ended up. I, uh, during my time in the military, I got the opportunity to travel to lots of beautiful countries and some not so beautiful. <laughs> um, and I, uh, I was stationed in Germany in the, uh, about mid nineties, early night, well, early nineties. Uh, and I, I had lots of friends that were German. I made a point to, uh, assimilate myself into the local community. Uh, I went out of the way to try to learn German as best I could. My grandmother used to speak it. And so I, I caught on a little bit of it, but I, I was able to speak and, and German pretty good. And I met lots of German farmers while I was there, um, just driving around with my, uh, with my Harley Davidson back <laughs> on the uh, back roads of, uh, of Germany. And, uh, and I, I just met these people and I was very interested in what they were doing. I had great conversations with them. So I learned a little bit more about farming then. So hence, of course, uh, I got stationed in many different places, uh, Louisiana, and then ended up back here at Fort Campbell, Kentucky in uh, about 1995 or so. And, uh, and it, I just... I love the whole community, the whole agricultural community, everything. So I involved myself, you know, in doing stuff with uh, different farmers around here. And, and, and then, you know, things happen and I PCS to uh, Fort Rucker and I was about to get out of the military and I said, hey, I want to go to flight school. Uh, totally scared of heights. <laughs> um, I, my, uh, my stepfather was in, the, uh, was also an aviator in Vietnam. And, and I just, I was like, you know, I was at 10 years. I thought I'd stay in and do aviation. It seemed kind of fun, uh, to fly, you know, helicopters. So I gave it a shot. Then I had the opportunity to go to Korea and that was a really, uh, eye-opening experience, you know, with farming. I learned, uh, I used to help out in the rice paddies. Oh, wow. Uh, I used to help out with, uh, doing the, um, their cattle, which, Wagyu beef over there. Mm -hmm. they, they are the masters and Kobe. It, it's, it's amazing what they do. Um, and it's all basic, uh, complete, uh, sustainable farming. So then hence, here we go. 2001. Um, I had a chance to come back to Fort Campbell, Kentucky again, and I jumped at it. So I arrived, I got here in August of 2001 and, uh, I went out to, uh, the range uh, to shoot my nine millimeter on September 11th and everything changed. Uh, and uh, my entire life changed at that point and my yeah. career changed at that point. Um, I decided to uh, go ahead with my farm, but I, I was like, well, I'm going to be deploying a lot. I'm going to be busy a lot. So I started out with horses, I found out real quick about horses. You know, you start out with, you know, how, how do you, you know, start out with a small fortune with horses? You start <laughs> out with a big one. Uh, you know, so I learned real quick, but it was for my stepdaughter at the time. She was into high school and junior rodeos. So uh, I would return from a deployment and get home, wash myself up, get right in the truck with the trailer. The horse is already loaded and we head out somewhere in the Southeast. Uh, uh -huh. And that was my, that was my life there for many, many years. And then I decided uh, about 2008, 2009, the stepdaughter decided she didn't want to do horses anymore. She liked boys and cars. So uh, <laughs> that kind of went away. So the horses decided to go away and, uh, but I still had cows left. Uh, so I decided to do this cattle thing. I started reading up on cow calf operations. I started reading up on freezer beef operations. Uh, and I found that maybe I can make a little bit of money. So, uh, I went ahead and processed one of the cows that I had left because we used to do team roping and I had a team roping arena in, in our back pasture and I had a few cows left. So I had them processed, uh, one of them, and I brought the cooler of beef, uh, to my unit, uh, on uh, Fort Campbell and, I sold it all uh, yeah. pretty fast. Uh, and the reason I sold it all is because I was really uh, ignorant when it came to pricing. <laughs> um, that was something, uh, an educational experience. And also, yeah. like I say, a self-critiquing moment where, you know, it cost me, you know, pretty good amount to get this thing processed and to actually bring it up to, you know, processing weight, the feeding, the time, everything, my time, my farm's time. And I was selling, you know, filet mignons for $1.99 a pound. So yeah. I quickly, you were everybody's <laughs> best friend. <laughs> <laughs> so I quickly learned that probably wasn't the best thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I went ahead and I said, well, maybe I'm on something here. So I went ahead and got a few more cows. Uh, and then I said, well, I want something that's going to 
uh, be different. I always like to be different. I always like to try to you know push the envelope on different things. So I, I decided to go into Texas Longhorns. Had no idea about these things. So I bought six of them after a, a, about a two month deployment in Afghanistan, saved up my money. And I went ahead and bought my first little herd about 2009, uh, put them in my barn. They were all small. Uh, and then I left uh, for another deployment, came back, you know, fed them. Then I went to, again, deployment, came back. And they're still living in my barn for a few months. And then the time came, I had to move into the pasture. This was another learning lesson. I didn't really realize, you know, how hard it would be to, it, it's, it's, all, it's like herding cats. Yeah. Uh, you let them out of the barn. You don't have, you know, the right equipment, the right pens, the right, you know, shoots, the, the alleyways, yeah. all those things. I didn't pay attention to any of that because um, I didn't know anything about it. And uh-huh. So uh, I uh, got a couple other warrant officers and we all decided to wrangle these things in the backyard. <laughs> and at that point, I said, you know, I think I need to learn about cattle. So uh-huh. I started learning. I uh, went through a master beef producer course that is offered mm-hmm. through the Tennessee uh, University of Tennessee Extension Office. Mm-hmm. And uh, I learned about cattle. And about that time, I was really doing well. And I was getting close to retirement. Uh, I was a CW4. Um, I was already at 28 years. I was like, you know, I think it's I'm kind of done. I think I'm ready to retire. Uh, and so I looked at, uh, I was going to get out. I was going to be a, a professor anyway. Uh, I still am. I teach uh, aviation uh, subjects for Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University for undergrad students. And But then I want to be a farmer. Uh, and that's what I really want to. So I looked at cattle. Uh, and I just kind of sat down. I did the numbers. I looked at everything. I had already bought another 20 acres uh, years before where I kept my cattle on. And uh, I was like, well, you know, I want to try something different. So I started reading up on horticulture stuff. You know, I really wasn't into it. And I was let me try something. So I wanted to be the tomato baron of, of Middle Tennessee. So <laughs> that's what I was going to be. So I started studying and looking into, you know, tomatoes and different types and all the varieties and cultivar, everything that was out there. Uh, so I decided to go with this uh, variety called Mortgage Lifter. The name kind of sounded cool. Uh, the history behind it was, you know, the guy who invented it, you know, produced him and was, had enough money with him to pay off his mortgage. And that's where yeah. the name came from. Uh, and then I started growing. I grew, um, I think it was 140, I believe, that I uh, got. So I set out a plot in my tomatoes, and uh, it was within three, four weeks, they were all dead, except for about two. I learned real quick about, you know, uh, what to do with soil and soil amendments and how to get mm-hmm. your soil ready and prepared and which uh, cultivars would really do well in middle Tennessee and, and the nasty little thing called a tomato worm. Yeah. Uh, me, and, me and that thing went, 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 you know, had some time. <laughs> we did. Um, but then I noticed that there was something that survived and it was my uh, companion flowers that I planted with them. Uh, and I just said, wow, these things are, you know, they're surviving They're You know, it's a hundred degrees out here and, they, and I have them. There's no water and these things are thriving and I didn't sell any bouquets. I just enjoyed them. And I was like, well, let me let me study up a little bit on floriculture. Uh, and I, so I did. I devoted an entire winter to learning about floriculture and all the parts and pieces of floriculture and the marketing and everything about it. And then in 2018, uh, after I retired in 2017, in 2018, I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and try flowers. So I tried about three rows of flowers. And I said, well, maybe I can sell these. So I started making bouquets. I learned how to make bouquets through YouTube and on the internet. And uh-huh. my specialty is the spiral bouquet is what I make. And I, I just picked it up and I started making them and, and people liked them. And they started, you know, coming out to the farm. They wanted to buy these little bouquets I had. And I'm like, well, this is kind of cool. So I found a little uh, local market, uh, a store that uh, allowed me to put some bouquets in. And I was, these things were selling out really quick. And I was like, well, maybe I'm on to something here. Um, so then 2019 came and I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna try a little bit bigger operation. So I expanded out from three rows to about five. <laughs> Not a real big expansion. but yeah. uh, And then I, I decided to go back to the Clarksville downtown market. I had been a vendor there before with my beef operation. So I decided to turn, return with flowers. And I mean, I couldn't believe it. People were just in love with these things. And my first market, I'll never forget it. I sold out within 30 minutes. Wow. Um, I learned that one, I didn't cut enough flowers uh, and didn't have <laughs> enough flowers. Uh, and two is that people really love these things and they, and they like the, the happiness uh, mm-hmm. of it and getting bouquets. So it kind of how, how it started all out. And, and then the pandemic came. 
And, you know, I really thought, you know, I was going to have a rough time. I thought, you know, this is going to be tough. I don't know how the market's going to go. And I had went ahead and expanded even larger. Uh, and I was, and I expanded out to, uh, there were like eight rows I, is what I went to. Um, I set them up in a kind of an agritourism kind of photography setup, which I had learned through a couple of different sources. And I started, I, I planned really a lot, a lot of flowers <laughs> during tons that, that year. I mean, this is 2020 pandemic started and we had our market and I brought the flowers there and people were just, they wanted to smile. Yeah. Um, they wanted something to make them happy um, during that, that terrible time. And, and I, I was like, wow, I started selling out every weekend within an hour. Uh, hour and a half, I was selling, you know, over, you know, 40 to 50 bouquets. Um, wow. And my bouquets are all handmade right there in front of you. I, I don't have any pre-made bouquets. And, uh, and that was my first year uh, of agriculture that I actually made a profit. Wow. Uh, after, you know, starting in 2001, uh, it took me, you know, almost 19 years <laughs> to, to get a profit. Uh -huh. um, and that was okay. I was okay with that. And, you know, with, with agriculture itself, I, I found, you know, that it gave me solace. Uh, it gave me my ability to cope with everything in the world. You know, um, the military is a hard place to be. Uh, mm -hmm. And I spent my career and life in there. Uh, I was an institutional man. You know, this is all I ever knew was three meals a day and, uh, and who and salute and go where they told me to go to uh, go, you know, kill bad people. Uh, mm -hmm. That was what I did. Uh, and I absolutely loved it. But when I left the military, I found that I was missing that mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, I needed something to help me cope with that. And I found agriculture to be my little safe place. Uh, I found agriculture uh, that was somebody that would listen to me. Uh, I found agriculture um, that was a person that did, uh, that gave no judgment. Uh, mm -hmm. on either my operation was a success or it was a failure. It was still just agriculture. And I quickly found that it was up to me. I had to, uh, I had to, you know, come out of my dark place and I had to, you know, be the small uh, business owner that I knew I could be. I am a, you know, 100% vetrepreneur. Uh, <laughs> I believe in uh, vetrepreneurship and yeah the farm and, and everything about it gave me that, gave me that peace. And it's, it's now this year, it's been absolutely incredible. Uh, it really has. That's so. awesome. Well, you know, you, you, you're talking about how agriculture and your farm has brought you so much solace and, and healing. And, you know, it's been such an important part of your life for the last 20 years or so. And I know that recently you have, you've been exploring a new path related to that and received some training in horticulture therapy. And so I would love to hear about that. I think that is a really interesting topic. And I, I hear like twinges of people kind of talking about this all the time. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that is, what your training was and what you plan to do with that. Right. I, I found a horticulture therapy um, kind of by accident. I actually started just doing some research on some type of, uh, you know, mental health therapy that, you know, I could use agriculture as part of, because I had already been doing it anyway with, uh, I've been doing briefings on Fort Campbell a lot. I've been doing, you know, presentations at different conferences and I'm, I'm picked Tennessee conference. I know that, you know, I met you first time was at one of the, uh, the SOG uh, mm -hmm. conference and, uh, and all these wonderful things. And I was like, there's gotta be something out there that, you know, is part of therapy, mental health improvement and using plants and animals and everything. And bam, I found it. It was horticulture therapy. And I, and it came up my first uh, search on a, you know, search engine. <laughs> and there it was, I was like, holy moly, it, there is something out there like that. And uh, so I, I started looking and researching into it and spent about, it's been about two years really researching into it and seeing all about it. And then uh, I was kind of trying to find some programs out there that actually did it. Uh, and, and then I participated, I remember back in about 2014, I did, I participated in a program with my future teacher <laughs> in the HT program. And he came to uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, and we did a horticulture therapy activity. And I was like, this is really cool. Uh, and then lo and behold, uh, Dr. Derek Stowell from uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville, he uh, developed this program. 
It was a, it's a seven month program, a horticulture therapy uh, program, uh, and it was the most amazing thing I think I've done in many many years. Uh, it was seven months of therapy for me. Um, it was amazing. We learned a lot. You know, think about horticulture therapy itself. The horticulture part is was actually kind of a kind of a side item for for the course. You know, we learned more about the therapeutic side, integrated and complementary care. Uh, and how to integrate uh, horticulture therapy into programs and how to start your own programs and how to run them. And that, you know, and that this is nothing new. Uh, it was actually, uh, there's actually um, evidence-based theory that was actually established by Benjamin Rush uh, back in the 1700s. Uh, he was actually called the father of modern psychology and he was one of the original signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and he, uh, he saw through how plants were able to heal people who were having mental illness. And mm. um, back then it was you know, called different things, but uh, I, I grabbed onto it and, and I started really reading into it. And once I had the ability to go to this course and, and learn all these different parts and pieces of it, I was like, yeah, this is my jam. Uh, this is really cool. And, and being able to integrate it into what I'm doing already has mm -hmm. been fantastic. So I, I do, um, right now I'm doing some pro bono stuff. I'm trying to get my, uh, my name out there as far as horticulture therapy part. People know me as far as the flower dude, uh, yeah. but I'm trying to get out more as a, of a HT, um, professional. Um, so I've been, I'm on a board, uh, with the, uh, Stephen A. Cohen military family treatment clinic here in Clarksville, Tennessee, and, uh, and a couple other boards, but this one, uh, is really cool. I'm able to use their community room and be able to be on their schedule for community room events using HT horticulture therapy programming. I've already done two uh, projects with them. Uh, did a bouquet building class. We've done gourd painting. The next one I have coming up actually this month towards the end of the month is going to be uh, a uh, herb drying class and how to make your own herb drying rack. Uh, then we have one in October, um, a program that's going to be how to make your own pumpkin base. Uh, for dried flowers and stuff, and uh -huh. also for Halloween. So those are some of the things that I've been doing. Then I do stuff out here at the farm. Um, when people come out and uh, visit the farm, I'm able to, you know, to work. Um, they, they come out here and do uh, pick your own flowers and stuff. But we also do walks. We do talks. We do, I, I, I tell them about the flowers. I, I show them about how the bouquet is built and how it works. And I get the smile on their face uh, and they say how wonderful it was and how soothing and common it is. And that's, that's my goal is to be able to provide a different type of care um, than your standard, you know, mental health facilities. You know, there's, a, there's this, of course, a stigma uh, attached to mental health care and, and a lot with, with the male population uh, mm -hmm. and especially veterans, you know, with that proud veteran self and, and don't want to admit, you know, that you might have a problem, might have just a small weakness, a, a, a small, you know, a uh, little dent in your shield, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, but it, it's all good. It's, it's okay. I'm a, I'm a proud, you know, member of my local uh, mental health community. Um, I, still do my therapy uh, as much as I can. I, I still take my meds. I still have, you know, the, the nightmares. I still have the issues, but, you know, I always lean back on my agriculture and on my horticulture mm -hmm. part. It, it, it soothes me. It refocuses me. Um, I can have the worst day in the world, um, but as soon as I step my foot out my flowers, it's all erased. And I don't let I don't want anybody coming to my flowers angry and pissed off. I want them to be calm. I want them to enjoy. So we'll do things prior to uh, moving out to, to the flowers. And then once I get out to the flowers, I can see the relief. Um, you can almost, you can hear it. Um, you can see it in their face. And then when they leave, just the smiles that they have, that's all I want. I, I really care less about the money part. Uh, I like the, the smiles. I like the, uh, the improvement that I can make in that person's life. Um, you know, whatever they're going through, uh, horticulture therapy, I found, is just an amazing tool to be able to set their mind back in a, in a good, straight direction and know outside truths of thoughts. All you're thinking is how beautiful that flower, that flower garden was and mm -hmm. that you remember it for the, for the rest of your life. So, mm -hmm. um, and I, I just, again, you know, I'm hoping to kind of expand out a little bit more. I'm, my farm is slowly morphing into just not production uh, of flowers, but I've moved it into more of a, uh, of a therapeutic horticulture pr uh, presence. 
people may have heard of care farms before. Care farms, that, mainly the ones that I've, I've seen and talked to, the ones that deal with animals. Um, they have, you know, usually they're rescues and they immerse themselves uh, with the animals. And, and, and that's, that's the treatment. You're uh-huh. out there, you're feeding them, you're, you're doing, you're playing with them. Um, I want that to be with my farm. I don't have any stock anymore. The cows are gone. Uh, I sold my operation uh, a few years ago, the cattle operation to another great veteran. Um, and my, my farm's just totally for you to come out and enjoy. Uh, mm-hmm. I built a, a walking trail on my wood line uh, where I'm developing a sensory walking trail, uh, which is going to be full of everything, herbs, uh, every, you know, sensory feel, touch, smell, everything visual um, that you can just walk and enjoy. Uh, I built an observation deck. You can um, go on it, um, do yoga on the uh, deck also out in the woods. You're able to see my mushroom operation that I have going on in the wood line. So all those things combined, uh, you know, is, is to make somebody's mind just at ease. And then for them to say, wow, that was, that was different. You know, uh-huh. that's, that's all I want to see. I want to see their eyes light up. And then when they leave, I want them to be excited. I want them to be happy. I want them to, when they're driving away from my farm and going back to wherever they're at, I want them to continue to think about how wonderful it was and how beautiful, you know, horticulture therapy can be for people who may not be able to sit in a normal, you know, everyday clinical setting. And that's part of my my goal is to make these local mental health care facilities be a little bit more inviting and bring more horticulture into them and plants and not make the waiting room so clinical. Um, Mm -hmm. That's a scary thing. Um, And that's why a lot of people don't go because some of these waiting rooms can be a a very jarring experience. So I want to make them beautiful. I want them Mm -hmm. to come in and just be immersed in all things horticulture. And uh, hopefully I'm on my way. We'll see. Yeah. I have no doubts, Charlie. I I can uh, hear the passion, and I've I've uh, known you for a, a few years, and I, and seen all that you have been able to accomplish. So I think that is a wonderful goal. And I know just talking to you about this, like I have a smile on my face, and you know, I I can just I know that release when you go outside, and so I can. I can feel that for all the folks that you get to encounter and and work with. So I think that is amazing work. And I look forward to hearing how that progresses and and knowing that you are helping so many people, veterans and farmers and uh, just uh, folks in general. um, As you said, mental health is not... um, you know, it's not talked about a whole lot. I think that's, that's changing, thankfully, and definitely Mm -hmm. changing in the farmer world. Um, It's such an important topic and it it has such a, such an impact on, on so many people. And so I'm finding all of these ways that um, you you can find your niche of how you can help serve in that world, I, I think is, is amazing. And using, you know, kind of your whole journey from your military upbringing to that just desire to have a farm and your, your own personal farming journey, how it all leads to this one thing. So I think that is, is really amazing. Learn how to harvest the sun twice with practical information at NCAT's AgriSolar Clearinghouse. Get access to more than 400 peer-reviewed articles, the latest in AgriSolar news, and connect with farmers and solar developers who are working together to make the most out of our shared resources. We'll see you at agrisolarclearinghouse.org. So you've mentioned a couple of things I want to kind of circle back on. Sure. You mentioned that you had um, gone through the Master Beef course with the University of Tennessee Extension. I think you've probably done some other trainings. I I'm curious to know because um, that part of part of our podcast here is you know sharing about resources and programs and things that you've used along your farming journey and and how they have helped you. So I'm just curious. If there are any things that stand out, if you have ever used USDA programs um, to help, you know, put in infrastructure or, or use on your farm or any other um, programs and resources that you're like, oh, people should know about these. These were really instrumental for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I when I first started out with uh, doing anything agriculture, <clears throat> I, I'm a voracious learner. Uh, I'm a voracious reader. Uh, and I, I usually just immerse myself in everything information uh, on the subject that I, that I have at hand. And 
again, agriculture. Uh, so I immersed myself in, in all kinds of stuff. Now, when I first started, like I said, with cows and, and all that, I, I learned about that stuff after the fact, after yeah. I got the cows <laughs> and after all this. And, and, and I was like, wow, uh, I think I might need to change my, my thinking on this a little bit. So again, I, you know, Tennessee, University of Tennessee Extension and Tennessee State University uh, Extension, it's a, it's a, a coordinated effort uh, mm-hmm. partnership between the two and so many different things that they offer. Uh, master series, um, I mean, ruminants, uh, master beekeeping, uh, the new farmer academy uh, mm-hmm. from TSU, all those things uh, combined, uh, just amazing educational opportunities. Um, so I took advantage of every single one of them. So if even if there's a master course that comes up, maybe you know growing grapes or or something, I'm gonna go ahead and take it. I, I may yeah. not do grapes. Um, I tried. <laughs> so that's one of them. That's, yeah. that's another little addition. Check that one, one off the list. I, yeah, I tried, and but you know, I, I learned about it, and mm-hmm. and I found, but that's not where I was going. But it's the knowledge. It, mm-hmm. It's it's always you know, um, saying knowledge is power. I, I don't really believe in that. I believe knowledge it just makes you more informed. It makes uh-huh. you a better farmer. It really does. You know, a lot like I I'm not a. I didn't come from a farming family. Um, right. you know, I, I'm, I'm a first generation, last generation uh, farmer uh, for me. It ends with me. So I, I wanted to learn everything I could. And I wanted to be a source of, of knowledge for other people. You know, if, if they couldn't find, you know, well, how do I get into you know this? Or how do I get into horses or cattle or ruminants or whatever? And I, I want to be there, especially veterans. I want to be a source for them. And I want to say, hey, well, I took this class. Or Mm -hmm. I learned this from this website or this source, you know, either, you know, from NCAT, you Mm -hmm. know, or learning from lots of other uh, opportunities out there. And so I decided to just combine all that and make my own kind of a source list of things. And that's what I talk, you know, with other uh, veteran farmers or beginning farmers Mm -hmm. to say, hey, get your education and also use those resources that are available for you. It's, it's really incredible uh, when, when people, they, they want to start in agriculture. And I said, well, have you ever heard of the farm service agency? Uh-huh. Um, they're like, nope, never heard. Of it. <laughs> have you ever heard of the USDA? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, let's start there. Uh-huh. Uh, but then from the USDA, we just go from there. So farm service agency, the NRCS mm-hmm. uh, and all those things that um, we can do. So I, I engaged my local FSA in my, in my NRCS office. Basically, I got in their face back in about 2010 or so when I was looking to buy extra land for my cattle, uh, and I found them, and I found all these programs that they offer, and I found, mm-hmm. I didn't know I could have a farm number uh-huh. uh, you know, with the <laughs> FSA. That was really cool. I didn't know that they had these other programs out there, like EQIP program, you know, and uh and ECP and all these other different programs are, that are out there. And I was like, I want to use them. And I got my first use when I had a really bad flood. Uh, mm. That's another self critiquing moment is never put your fence line right next to a, uh, a known flood flooding Creek, you know, uh-huh. especially in a really heavy rain. So I, I quickly learned about that. And, but the, uh, the FSA helped me recover from that. I had mm-hmm. no idea. So, you know, I, I learned I could get paid for recovering my land and yeah. the work and effort that I put into it. So I really started learning about all those different programs. And then NRCS, uh, I became very involved with them. I, I really was interested in their whole nature of soil conservation and, you know, all this stuff. And then you can see the hoop house that's in the picture uh, mm-hmm. behind me. That is an NR, NRCS program called Equip. Mm-hmm. I uh, entered it. It took me two times. Uh, I guess second time was the charm. And I finally got it uh, about, this is my second year, September, I think it was 2020. Yeah, 2020. I went ahead and was like, hey, they approved me. And they came out, uh, the the Mennonite army came out and set that thing up for me in about seven hours. And, oh, wow. uh, and, I, and I was already, yeah, I know some people, you know, they do it. And it takes a long time to get these things up, but uh-huh. fortunately, we have a really good integrated program here with NRCS and a program and a group, a, a company out of uh, Kentucky, Elkton, Kentucky, uh, called Cena Greenhouses that actually will come and build it for you mm-hmm. literally seven hours. Wow. Uh, I went inside, came back out after lunch, and uh, they were done and packed up and ready to go. 
uh, and I started uh, planning that thing about two weeks later um, nice. to get ready for the uh, for the fall season. Uh-huh. Um, so that's that's a really good program, and and all the different programs that are out there. You know, you have to just go search for them. Go search USDA. Mm-hmm. Um, go on USDA.gov and and look at the. You know, they have beginning farmers on there, veterans. Uh, as veterans, we were with the 2018 Farm Bill. We were actually put into the Farm Bill finally, and we were mentioned in there, veterans, veteran farmers, thanks to Farmer Veteran Coalition and a mm-hmm. lot of good lobbying uh, to get that done. With Michael Gorman being a um, a really good source for that, yes. And it was really fantastic to to finally have that and the programs that they offer and open to us, but it still amazes me that some you know, people don't know about it, you know, right. and that's, that's what my goal, that's my goal. It's one of my goals is to educate, um, mm-hmm. is to put it out there for, you know, other beginning farmers, veteran farmers that, Hey, these sources are here for you and they want to help you. They have money. They want to give it to you. They really mm-hmm. do. You just yeah. gotta, you just gotta do the right thing. You gotta, you know, do the right, go through the right sources and how you're supposed to do it and grants and all this. I will put out there that there is no grant out there that will give you a free farm. It's no. not. <laughs> um, I have lots of questions about yes. that. You know, that USDA provides, you know, money for a farm. Well, not, not necessarily. Right. Uh, they do, yes. but you got to pay that back. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, I got my first uh, big loan through the FSA um, farm ownership program. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how I bought um, my 20 acres for my cattle when I did back about 2010, 2011. Uh, and then, you know, I, again, I, I immerse myself in all things education wise as, as agriculture and, and horticulture and everything. So, you know, I can help other veterans who are transitioning out of the military and other beginning farmers, civilians, it doesn't matter that I can be a source for them, you know, mm-hmm. that what I've done, my farm, you know, is, is an example of what can be done if you just put your head into it. If you really put yourself into it, sure, it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you sweat. It's going to cost you blood. It's going to cost you tears. Um, (laughs) All of those things are going to come around. But at the end, if you just keep going and you don't give up, you will be successful. I I know you will. It just takes that effort. It takes, you got to have it inside of you. And that's the wonderful thing about veterans. We have, we have that purpose, motivation and direction. uh, And that's what agriculture provided for me. And I like to see that provided for other veterans that want to be farmers. You know, I mean, I have, I, I mean, I farm, but of course I have other income. Uh, and that's pretty much the way most of agriculture is today. Family farms, you know, they're doing, um, you yep. know, we have our farm and we have our other things we do. You know, mm-hmm. I teach online. I, I do other stuff, you know, of course, my military retirement, all that combined. Plus, you know, I, I make a little bit, you know, off of doing this. And and I want other veterans that are interested in farming to look at and say, hey, I can do that too. You know, I can do this. And I'm not doing anything special. All I'm doing is things that I have read about and that are on the books already. And some things I've come up myself, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and, and develop myself through experimentation, failures, successes, both of those, and farm stress, uh, and all those combined, <laughs> you know, to uh, to hopefully make my operation successful. And uh, I think it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. But I still I think it is, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be able to be, like I said, a source for other veterans. Um, yeah. My farm is uh, finally through a, uh, as you know, the uh, USDA um, has the programs for nonprofit uh, educational institutions, basically the Ag Vets program and grant program. So Kentucky Extension, uh, University of Kentucky Extension, sorry, they uh, they got a grant about two years ago, I think, or a year ago, and they started to develop a mentorship program mm-hmm. and they wanted to see how it, it could work. So they finally reached, they reached out to me. And uh, so I'm going to be a mentor- mentorship farm for something that's called a, basically it's career skills program, a CSP. It's run by the Fort Campbell Civil Tap, uh, which is a Soldier for Life Transition Assistance Program. And you go through this program when you're getting out of the military. It's uh, you can take up to two years to do it. I took every single class they offered. I wanted to know the nuts and bolts of this operation that they have called Civil Tap. So I did everything when I got out, and I said, you know what? They're lacking. <laughs> um, they're, they, you know, they're pigeon, you know, pigeonhole and, you know, veterans getting out into just certain careers, truck uh-huh. driver, policeman, or a pipe welder. And I'm like, there's a lot more out there, especially mm-hmm. in the agricultural world. You know, whether you want to be on the farming side of it, producer side, or you want to be on the industrial side of agriculture, agriculture is everywhere. It's in mm-hmm. everything we do. So I was really excited to be able to be 
put on the list as an internship farm for some cohorts that are going to start in the spring. And that's, I'm hoping that we have some people that want to have interest in it because I want to teach that, you know, the next generation of farmers and yeah. veterans that are getting out of the military, we need them. Um, yes. You know, 80, 80%, uh, the last numbers, 80% of our population lives in concrete jungles and they have forgotten what a farm is or what it even, what is agriculture. Right. Um, Another uh, volunteer thing I do is work on Fort Campbell, Kentucky with the soldier recovery unit. It's called the SRU. And we have a community garden for the SRU patients and the soldiers that are there that are recovering, whether it's mental and or physical, they spend their time at this in this unit during the recovery to either they transition out of the military um, or they go on to another unit because they've been, you know, rehabilitated. Mm -hmm. uh, so this garden has existed since about 2012. It went into shambles for many years and they were going to lose it. So we resurrected it this year and we have uh, lots of participation in it. The uh, uh, battalion commander, who is the commander of the unit, the SRU, he is totally into this. Um, he wants to bring more agriculture into the soldiers uh, recovery plan. And I just found that was a, another great outlet to, to advertise to, you know, the soldiers say, hey, look, you know, there, there's here you can learn a little bit about farming. And I'm trying to integrate all that and working with the civil tap office to go, hey, look, there's veterans that are active duty that want to farm and they go to these programs and there's zero about agriculture. And I want them to know that there's a lot out there. Many MOSs, uh, military op occupational specialties um, that you have in the military. And I, I know I'm speaking more army, but I, this is across the, the, yeah. the gamut of services that can do this. And, you know, you might've been a generator mechanic. Okay. Well, you're thinking I have, you know, what do I do when I get out? I go repair some of these generators. Okay. Well, we have this huge thing here in Kentucky. Uh, it's called H&R AgriPower that uh, will probably hire you in a heartbeat because they service those things, you know, uh -huh. they do those things, you know, and me wield mechanics. They get out and they're like, well, I'm going to go work, you know, at a restaurant, you know, or I'm going to get into corporate America. And I'm like, no, uh, check it out. You have a skill that is needed in an agricultural world. Yes. Tractors break down. And they break down quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, so there's, you know, Kubota Tractor has programs. John Deere has programs to, you know, bring veterans in uh, and they want veterans. They know the discipline that the veteran has. They know the work ethic that the veteran has. You know, my target audience, I, I have basically three demographics that I shoot for when I talk. I shoot for the first termers. Those are your four year or less uh, people uh, that they're, they're still in their young 20s. They have no clue what they're going to do. They, they really are. They're like, well, I'm going to go to school. Okay, that sounds pretty awesome. What are you going to study? Uh, I want to get in. You know, I want to get an MBA. I'm like, okay, do you understand that everybody walking around out there has an MBA? I said, yeah. do something different. Do something, you know, I said, what about agriculture? Have you ever thought about that? And then their eyes light up and they're like, well, what can I do in agriculture? I'm like, well, just sit down and let's go over it. <laughs> um, and to bring that more out, to yeah. bring that to, to more veterans that say, hey, look, we want you in farming. You know, that says what the average farmer supply feeds about 150 people. That was the last average that I, that I read. So one farmer feeding 150 people. I, th I think we need more farmers. I, I think that the, uh, the small farm is starting to develop more than the large commercial operations. And I want to bring more of that to our communities. You know, food deserts exist. I mean, Nashville, for instance, is a huge city with food deserts inside mm -hmm. the city limits. We right. have food deserts here in Clarksville. We do have food, uh, food uh, deserts. And in Memphis, we have food deserts in Memphis. Urban farming, a magical, wonderful thing. We need to bring more of that rooftop gardens, mm -hmm. you know, botanical gardens, all those things to bring, you know, the, uh, the farm back, you know, into the community to understand what agriculture is. And then I'll go back to the SRU. So we did a luncheon actually last week before the four day weekend of Labor Day. And I was, and all the, the food that was there was Italian lunch. Uh, the battalion commander invited all people in, they invited me to come and, and, and uh, I was sitting next to, uh, it was a sergeant, uh, two of them. And uh, they were, talking about, you know, wow, this is beautiful, the flower, because I did table arrangements and they were like, this is beautiful, you know, where these come from? I said, well, they came from our garden here on Fort Campbell. And they're like, we had no idea. And I'm like, yeah, isn't that amazing? I said, you have a beautiful garden right here on Fort Campbell that you can go visit. And uh, then we started talking and, and I was like, you know, when she asked me about my farming background, I told her about Texas Longhorns and she was like, so Texas Longhorn, that that's a real animal. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. yeah. I said, Hey, we got some talking to do. So, yeah. you know, we started talking about 
farming, agriculture, cattle, and her eyes just lit up. She had no idea. And it's because she had never been to a farm in her life. Wow. She had never seen an agricultural operation. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, at the end of the conversation, she was like, I'm going to go out and look at a farm. I want to, I want to see what this is about. Uh, so who knows, maybe there's a new farmer that j- is starting out. So we never yeah. know. But I, I just think that you know, veterans are a great source for the agricultural world. I um, and mm-hmm. I believe that veteran farmers, you know, not not the pure future of agriculture, but I think by adding us in and, you know, and bringing us into agricultural war with our purpose, motivation and direction and our you know desire to be successful, no matter mm-hmm. what the circumstances are in front of us, uh, I think is a great addition to the whole agricultural operations. So. I agree 100% with that. And I think it's wonderful. You're out there being a a farmer evangelist and you're going to, you're (laughs) going to convert. I never heard of that. I like that one. Maybe, maybe I just coined a new term. I think you do farm evangelist. You're going to, you're going to convert some people and, and, um, and get some new farmers and, Charlie, I have so enjoyed visiting with you and hearing your journey from, you know, as a kid running around on farms to how that, um, you know, transferred through all your military service Mm -hmm. and has you where you are today in all the ways that you are serving farmers and farmer veterans and your community and I, I really enjoy seeing all your pictures of your beautiful flowers and farms, your farm. And I know that you are bringing a smiles to many people's faces. So keep up the good work. And I just really look forward to following, uh, following your journey and seeing what else um, you come up with. And um, like you said, you're always, you're always looking to do things a little bit differently and, and kind of push the envelope. And um, I think that is, wonderful and has taken you lots of great places. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Some, just some last words is, you know, yeah. um, for, for anybody out there that, that is listening to this, whether you're a veteran or you're, you know, beginning farmer, you're looking at it, go get an education first, get educated on the operation you want to do. You know, don't, don't just, you know, get stuck in one operation, look at diversify, look at all different types. You know, uh, I may do flowers, but I also do mushrooms. Um, I do uh, other types of plants for, for basically selling plants and also do agritourism events. So, you know, diversify yourself. Don't just keep yourself in one area. Get an education on all those different things you want to do. There's so much on the Internet right now for for education wise and so many seminars you can get into and and go to your uh, nearest farming conference you can go to. If you can mm-hmm. find it, you know, whatever it is, whatever the uh, pick Tennessee conference here in Tennessee that happens in February or any others, please, you know, go to it and try it out. Look at it. You may not be farming but just go look at it and see what's all available. It will blow your mind. And then if people want to still follow my journey, um, I'm on the Insta spam. It's uh, Jordan Farms TN, um, also on the Facebook. Please join me in my journey. And any questions you might have, please, I answer questions all day long and I don't mind doing it. That's what motivates me. That's what keeps me uh, here on this planet because that's what I want to do. I want to give back as much as I can. So thank you. Well, thank you, Charlie. And I, I, I really do appreciate just your passion and, and all that you are doing to give back. So I, I know others will love to join you on that journey. So thank you again okay. for, for visiting with me today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.